which is a 210 year old farmhouse built by one of the earliest settlers, although this room is relatively new. The Charlotte Hobbs Memorial Library in Lovell is hosting a series of Meet the Author events, and this evening's author is Lincoln Payne, a Mainer. Lincoln is the author of five books on maritime history, including the award-winning The Sea and Civilization, which is the focus of the evening, A Maritime History of the World. He has lectured on maritime history in the US, India, China, Australia, and Europe. He's on the board of the Maine Maritime Museum in Bath, Bath, I guess. He and his wife live in Portland. Their daughters happen to be named for ships, not, I hope, for British Royal Navy ships, such as the Indomitable and the Inflexible. I'm excited that the, to be the interviewer this evening because of my own strong interest in history, especially that about the rise and fall of empires. And as this evening's focus book, The Sea and Civilization, points out, maritime issues have been central to the development of many empires. And in fact, maritime issues are also central to my own career <coughs> of international business. Uh, again, could the new people please mute themselves so we don't get interfering sounds? So about his work, a reviewer from the US Naval Academy wrote, Lincoln Payne is heroic in sweep of vision and poetic reverence. Uh, having read a big chunk of this book, I totally agree. So the format is that I'm gonna ask Lincoln some questions for the first 10 to 15 minutes, and then he'll do a reading for uh, 10 minutes or so. And then I'll have some more questions, follow-up questions. And then lastly, we'll we will open it up to general questions for the last 30 minutes or so, and we will end strictly by 8 p.m. Uh, feel free to use the chat function to type your questions as we go along, and I'll look at those when we get to the question and answer period. So thank you very much, Lincoln, for joining us this evening. So the first question, you've written <laughs> five books about maritime history, as well as more than 100 articles, book reviews, and public and academic lectures. How did you get into this topic? Well, it, it began in childhood. Um, I, was, I grew up in New York, in Manhattan, and um, I lived there, I lived on an island until I moved to Maine in 1996. <laughs> um, and then I moved to the mainland. And occasionally I get out to islands again, but um, my formative years were in Manhattan. And uh, when I was very young, about seven or eight years old, uh, they founded South Street Seaport. And my stepfather was very interested in ships. He had sailed a lot. He had been transatlantic on ocean liners many times. And he was very interested in the museum. And so we started going down on weekends and looking at, um, they slowly built up their collection of ships. Uh, the biggest one when I was uh, very young was the Wavertree, which was a Liverpool ship that had been abandoned in Buenos Aires and then brought back to New York and underwent a, a very, very, very long, slow, ponderous restoration. And it finally started sailing again about five years ago. So I think it was being restored for about 40 or 50 years. Um, in any event, uh, he, I also, in high school, I spent a summer as an intern working for um, Opsail 76, which was the great parade of ships for the uh, American Bicentennial. And I got very interested in the vessels there. I got to visit a lot of them, uh, doing such glamorous things as delivering mail. Um, but that got invited me um, below deck uh, for beers with the crew because I had mail, so they liked me a lot. And um, again, when I was in college, I took a semester off and worked for a, a son of Opsail called Harbor Festival 79 and a few more events like that. And then after college, I, uh, I went into publishing. Uh, well, I went into a variety of things, but mostly in publishing. And I wound up for three years as editor of Sea History Magazine, uh, which is still published by the National Maritime Historical Society, but it had actually started at South Street. And uh, then I went back into publishing uh, and I did seven years of academic reference books. And in the course of that, um, editors don't get paid very much. And I, I started having children and things like that. And I thought, um, 
that it would be a good way to supplement my income would be to write my first book, which was an encyclopedia of historic ships. And it was at that point that I realized that we didn't pay the authors very much either. Um, so I wound up with two very demanding jobs and uh, two small children living in New York. And um, anyway, that book came out. And as a result of that, uh, Ships of the World, I evolved this idea of writing a, history, a maritime history of the world. And that was the genesis of, of that project. Yeah, fan fantastic. And um, you obviously like ships a lot, but what is it in particular that you most like about ships? Well, the um, ships are essentially time capsules of the period in which they exist. <clears throat> and sometimes they, uh, you know, they, sometimes they're sort of murdered at birth. Um, like the Vasa, which sank on its maiden voyage about 20 minutes in. Uh, other times they last for thousands of years. Um, the, uh, the Khufu ship at the, um, that was buried at the base of the Great Pyramid of Giza is a great example. Um, but when we find them either in context or we read about them in context, they really convey a lot about what was happening in the world that they are part of. Um, and very often, because they're involved in trade, you find them with goods that are not representative of the place that they are where they're found, um, but that are representative of the time but of a great geographical area. So some of the great archaeological sites of the Mediterranean and uh, the South China, South China Sea, um, Indonesia, uh, from very remote periods in history, tell us a great deal about how dynamic the world was and how interconnected the world was at a time when most people think nothing really was happening. Oh yeah, that's right, the, the early uh, globalization. In fact, talking of sinking ships, I think in your book, you mentioned them finding wine dating back 2000 years, is that right? Yes. Was uh, it still drinkable? I don't think so, um, and I, I like wine, but I don't think I would have been one of the people to volunteer. Um, I know that somebody opened, I think that somebody opened a, um, some wine that was about two or 300 years old uh, that was found somewhere in Europe about five or 10 years ago. And it, it, it had turned, um, but it was still wine and it was recognizable. And what's fascinating about um, wine and other food goods that are found in archeological contexts is that you can really study them in great detail. And things like paleobotany and paleozoology um, were able to find out exactly what the extent of trade was and particularly trade in goods that um, are perishable. So in, uh, on the Red Sea at a very early time, uh, first few centuries before Christ, um, there are archaeological sites where they've found evidence of Indian traders based on the foods that were, the remains of which are still there, that are not native to Egypt or anywhere in the Mediterranean world. So food, um, although it isn't edible, is a very good source of information about the extent of maritime trade. Yeah, that's right. And then you were talking about the evolution of the ships, and we were talking before this evening about how the modern US Navy ships don't even have decks, like the Zumwalt class. What, why has that happened? <clears throat> um, I, I'm not exactly, well, it's, it has to do with the technology of, of modern shipping and modern warfare. Okay. Um, and I, I get up to Bath on a fairly regular basis, even this year, and um, I sometimes see one of the Zumwalt class destroyers and I had dinner with, with a designer um, of one of them. <clears throat> I forget what part he was, um, he was responsible for, but I think it was the electronics. And I, I made the mistake of saying that I thought that the Zumwalt class were aesthetically underperforming and he took great umbrage, um, but he was wrong. They are aesthetically yeah. underperforming. And um, they're very unmaritime like uh, they, because they have no decks, they're, they're basically huge metal cylinders um, with only one purpose, and that is to, to kill other ships and people. 
Um, one of the great things about uh, navies and ships, and particularly in the American naval tradition, is that for a long time they were ambassador, roving ambassadors of this country. So even though they were equipped to fight, they also had a, a very important role in terms of demonstrating America's commitment to alliances and to culture and to establishing ties and uh, sharing norms of legal uh, expectation. Mm -hmm. um, and ships like the Zumwalt and ballistic uh, nuclear uh, submarines, they don't have that mission. No. Um, they're there to, to threaten. And um, I, I think that there's a, a big, there's big uh, separation between the military and diplomacy um, now that there wasn't for a long time. So not like the black ships that sail into Tokyo Harbor to intimidate the Japanese. No, and I mean, you're right that there was a degree of intimidation, but there was, you could, you could go either way. Um, you know, you can't even have a deck, a, a ceremony on deck on a Zoom world, um, <laughs> because there is no deck. Um, you know, even the uh, Missouri, um, which on which they signed the Japanese surrender, um, you know, you had the ability to have a ceremony that signified a peace, um, even though it was a battleship designed primarily for killing. Yeah. Great white fleet. Let's, 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 thank you very much. Um, let's go on to sort of the writing process. I mean, how, how do you spend your time? Um, like during a week or over a year, what percentage of your time are you actually writing or researching? I think I hear my mother calling. <laughs> um, I, that's, a, that, that's the hardest question on, um, that you can ask me because I really don't know. I spend an enormous amount of time worrying about what I'm doing. I spend an enormous amount of time actually doing stuff I spend a lot of time writing, but I'm not exactly sure how it all fits together. And that's not a very satisfying answer for, for you. And it's, it's, it's a terrifying answer for me because I'm actually in the process of writing a book and a, an article and some other things. Um, so my process is, is really sort of a mess. Um, and it takes a very long time for me to do things, but it, it does eventually come together. But there's a lot of research. There's a lot of, um, I'm, I spend, a, I think the first thing I do when I, when I tackle a project is I develop a bibliography. Mm -hmm. I have many bibliographies um, and I, I spend lots and lots of time looking for, for sources of information and um, vastly more than I could possibly read in a lifetime, much less you know, in a couple of months or a couple of years. Uh, for a project, um, but it's all there and I know where it is and I spend a lot of time downloading PDFs of articles from all sorts of obscure places. Um, when I was writing Sea and Civilization, um, the internet hadn't quite gotten the sophistication that it has now. And I spent about six months or maybe a year going to New York every month for about a week and staying at a, uh, an uncle's apartment and roaming the halls of the Columbia University library system. And it was actually, I'd, I'd gone to Columbia in the 70s when the university and the city were basically on the verge of bankruptcy, both of them. And I couldn't actually live on campus because I, I had a New York City address. So this was the closest I'd ever actually lived to the Columbia campus was when I was researching my book. But I spent a lot of time literally just parading up and down the stacks, looking for things. And you can find an awful lot serendipitously on the internet, obviously, but there's a, there's a, there was a real sense of exploration and wonder, just looking for hard copies of books and finding things. You know, there were many times when I would look for a book and of course it wasn't there, it was checked out or it was misplaced or it was lost or stolen. Um, but next to it, I would find something that I'd never even imagined looking for. And it would have, you know, it had some, something that took me in a completely different and exciting direction. And it became integral to the book. And then do you take notes on the books if you can't check them out? Or what do you do? Well, um, the 
the copy machine is a really great ally of researchers. Um, and then PDFs became an even greater ally of researchers. But having said that, um, I do have to take notes and that can be an excruciating process because I never know if I'm taking too many notes or too few notes, um, if I'm spending too much time going down the wrong rabbit hole, um, but it's all rabbit holes. So um, I spend a lot of time sort of stumbling with broken ankles from one place <laughs> to another before I get to the end of the field. Yeah, it's like writing one dissertation after another. That's what you're doing. It is. And, and, and in fact, while I was writing The Sea and Civilization, I, I stumbled into a PhD program and was supposed to write a doctoral thesis sort of alongside of this. And then um, it turned out that if I'd submitted the book as a dissertation, they would have given me a doctorate, but they wouldn't accept a published work as a dissertation. So they wouldn't give me a doctorate, at which point I sort of thought it was a game I didn't want to play anymore. So, Couldn't you get the doctorate first and then publish it? That's the, that's no, the... it, it didn't work that way. <laughs> so, yeah. I, so I'm neither, I'm neither fish nor fowl. I'm not an academic, but I'm not entirely a lay uh, writer either. Yeah. And then when you actually get to the writing, do you have a set time of day that you like to write? You know, like many people are morning writers, uh, like myself, for example. Um, I would like to say, yes, I have a, a, a great system where I get up at six every morning and don't drink tea until I've written three pages. And, and then I knock off for lunch and play with my dog. Um, but I, I don't even have a dog. And so none of that that I just told you is true. Uh, sometimes I get up and I'll, I'll feel moved to write. Uh, sometimes I will go a whole day without writing a word. And sometimes I will get up and I'll write for four or five hours at a, at a clip. Um, those days are very, very rare, however. But as I said, somehow at the end of this process, I've managed to cobble together a bunch of pages. Um, I guess one of the things that, you know, if you're, if you're looking, if, if people are interested in sort of the process, one of the things that I am pretty scrupulous about is I write longhand first. Oh. Um, and I'm not, I, I think the reason I do that is because writing longhand forces your mind to slow down because you can't write as fast as, I mean, you, you can't write as fast as you can think. Um, you can't type as fast as you can think, but you can type much, much faster than you can write by hand. And so I think that there, it's something, it's a calming effect on the writing and you actually get things out and you can sort of go back up the page and think, well, okay, that makes some sense. So I actually, on this talk that I'm preparing now, um, I wrote about nine pages longhand once and then I wrote it again. And then I finally entered it into the computer and I didn't look at it for about a week and opened it up yesterday feeling somewhat terrified. And I was actually pretty pleased. Um, it needed work, but it was not, it wasn't horrible. Whereas a lot of stuff that I've written on the computer first um, has been terrible because you're just sort of running away with things. The ideas are running away and you're typing them as fast as you can. And, and then you get into this sort of cut and paste. And I, I find it much easier to um, cut and paste when all you're doing is circling paragraphs and moving, you know, sort of drawing arrows and go put this on page five or move this up a line or whatever. Um, so longhand, I think, is a, is a great way to do things. You're making me feel guilty because in recent years, I actually dictate. So that's even faster than typing. But, uh, I, pour it out. <laughs> I worked for a guy who could um, dictate he, he dictated correspondence to his assistants and he would stop in the middle of a sentence to take a phone call, get on the phone for 10 minutes, hang up and then start in the middle of the sentence that he had left off and continue. And it was, yeah. it was horrible. <laughs> I hated it. <laughs> um, but everybody has their own way of um, dealing with words. Yeah. 
And you know, I'm not dictating. I'm not dictating to a secretary. I'm dictating to voice recognition, which is yeah. now very good, actually. Yeah. yeah, I, I, I don't do that for two reasons. One, um, I've tried it a few times. I don't like listening to my voice, mm. and um, that may be true of everybody listening to me now. Um, and then the other is that um, I, I just lose my way. Mm. You know, if you were here. Um, asking me questions after every couple of sentences, I might be able to write a book, but um, left to my own devices, I just ramble on endlessly. Okay, that's great. Let, let's move on to the book topics. Um, how do you choose each of the book topics? I mean, in your introduction, you sort of um, got us into that. Is there anything extra you want to tell us about the book topics? How do you choose the topics? Um, I, d I, don't, um, I don't know. I mean, I come up with ideas and I run them by my agent <clears throat> and he'll say yes or no. And um, I'm batting about 60% at this point. Um, the two ideas that he knocked down, um, well, the first idea that he knocked down was in 1996 or 97, I forget what year it is. People here will remember. Um, but about a year before a movie came out, I said, you know what would be a really great book is a Titanic A to Z encyclopedia. And he said, nobody cares about the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> that, um, I still have not let him forget that um, because that would have, it, it would have been, I mean, I'm not that interested in the Titanic, but I'd heard about this movie coming out and I thought, well, I might as well capitalize on it. And of course, nobody had any idea just how successful the movie would be. Um, and then after I wrote The Sea and Civilization, I wanted to write a book about rivers of the United States. And it's a very complicated concept. Um, and as much as I like the idea of the book, trying to figure out how I would actually do it, um, I never really felt that comfortable about it. But I wrote the proposal and he, he dutifully submitted it to several publishers and nobody quite got what I was doing. And I realized I hadn't quite gotten what I was doing either. So now I'm writing a more traditional maritime history of the United States. Oh. And the idea is to write a book about the United States in global perspective. So it's called Global America and How It Got That Way. Oh, that's um, because we are a maritime country and, and every, everything that happens in this country has a great deal to do with the sea. Um, and even the westward expansion has a great deal to do with rivers and lakes. That's great. So I think actually it's a good point for you to read to us. Let the audience hear some of your words. So you, you, some, you made some choices from the book, The Sea and Civilization. Okay. <clears throat> Um, this was a setup a bit, so I, I'm actually prepared to do this. So, um, so I'm going to read three. I'm going to read three uh, passages from the book. Uh, the first is from the first page of the introduction. Uh, the second is a, a briefish or abbreviated description uh, of the birch bark canoe. And the third is going to be about the discovery of the Khufu ship at the Great Pyramid of Giza. I want to change the way you see the world. Specifically, I want to, wait, I want to change the way you see the world map by focusing your attention on the blues that shade 70% of the image before you and letting the earth tones fade. This shift in emphasis from land to water makes many trends and patterns of world history stand out in ways they simply cannot otherwise. Before the development of the locomotive in the 19th century, culture, commerce, contagion, and conflict generally moved faster by sea than by land. The opening of sea routes sometimes resulted in immediate transformation but more often it laid the groundwork for what was later mistaken for sudden change. The best example of this is the trade networks of the Indian Ocean, the oldest of which were pioneered at least 4,000 years ago by navigators sailing between Mesopotamia and the mouths of the Indus River. By the start of the common era 2,000 years ago, the Indian subcontinent was a point of departure and destination 
for merchants and mendicants from across the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. This is all but unnoticed in the written record, which boasts of no figure comparable to a Gilgamesh or an Odysseus. And despite a growing body of archeological evidence, these undertakings remain largely unrecognized. As a result, the later arrival in Southeast Asia of Muslim traders from the Indian subcontinent in Southwest Asia, of Chinese merchants of various faiths, and of Portuguese Christians seem like so many historical surprises. Only the last were absolute newcomers to the monsoon seas that stretch from the shores of East Africa to the coasts of Korea and Japan. The others were heirs to ancient interlinked traditions of seafaring and trade that long ago connected the shores of East Africa with those of Northeast Asia. This book shows many similar examples of maritime regions that were quietly exploited before events conspired to thrust them into the historical limelight. <clears throat> and now <clears throat> for the birch bark canoe. And this uh, follows on a section where I've talked uh, about the um, settlement of the Arctic and the development of the kayak and <clears throat> umiaks and bidarkas and things like that. Boat builders living below the tree line have considerably more materials from which to fashion watercraft than do their Arctic counterparts. Most woodland Indian sites from 1000 BC to the centuries before the arrival of the Europeans were clustered around major rivers, notably the Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio, Illinois, and Tennessee, which were valuable for their fertile bottom grounds and fish resources and as avenues of communication. Tracing the evolution of woodland Indian watercraft over their long history is impossible, but we know that the art of building birch park canoes was perfected well before the 16th century. These were used extensively from the coasts of Newfoundland, the Canadian Maritimes in New England, westward up the St. Lawrence Valley and into central Canada, and across the Appalachian Mantle Mountains into the Midwest. Although canoes today are identified almost exclusively with inland waters, the Mi'kmaq are known to have used them to carry copper ingots from Nova Scotia across the Gulf of Maine as far as Cape Cod. The earliest descriptions of canoes are short on details, but uniform in amazement at their capacity, lightness, and speed. Factors that evidently impressed their makers too. The Penobscot word for canoe was aguidin, meaning floats lightly. Following his exploration of the coast of Massachusetts in 1603, the English explorer Martin Pring, awestruck by the canoes he encountered, brought one back to England. The preferred bark for building canoes comes from the paper birch, sometimes called canoe birch, which grows across North America in a wide band, the northern limit of which extends from Labrador to the Yukon River and the coast of Alaska, and the southern boundary of which runs from Long Island to the Pacific coast in northern Washington state. Bark at least one-eighth inch thick was peeled from the tree and the sheets sewn together with preferably the root of the black spruce and made watertight with spruce gum to form the outer shell of the canoe. The variety of such canoes was enormous and depended as much on the use and waters for which they were intended, cargo, passengers, or warfare, lakes, streams, or rapids, as on their makers. Whereas the frame of a kayak was assembled first and the skin wrapped around it, the bark canoe was a skin first construction. The canoe, writes John McPhee in his classic work, The Survival of the Bark Canoe, began the assembly with bark. He rolled it right out on the building bed, white side up, and built the canoe from there. Lashing the bark to the gunnel frame, he made, in effect, a birch bark bag. Then he lined the bag with planking. Then, one by one, he forced in the ribs. The resulting canoe was lithe, supple, resilient, strong. The bark canoe is a vehicle of primary importance after the arrival of Europeans in North America, especially the canot de maître or maître canot built for French voyageurs and their Indian partners in the fur trade of central Canada. 
As one historian has written, these must be looked upon as the national watercraft type historically of Canada and far more representative of the great years of national expansion than the wagon, truck, locomotive, or steamship. Canoes and kayaks are barely built in the traditional manner today, but fiberglass, canvas, and aluminum versions modeled on Native American originals are among the most popular recreational craft in the world, and canoeing and kayaking are Olympic sports. Ample testimony to the inherent simplicity of their form and function and to the skill required to master their use. So interestingly, in the book, we go directly from that to um, Egypt. And from Egypt, it takes a, a more um, linear, geographically hopscotching, but linear, chronologically linear approach right up to the present. In the spring of 18, 1954, Employees of the Egyptian Antiquities Service were removing debris from around the base of the Great Pyramid at Giza. The effort was a routine bit of housekeeping, and there was little expectation of uncovering anything of significance in a place that had been worked over by tomb robbers, treasure seekers, and archaeologists for 4,500 years. As they cleared the rubble, workers came across the remains of the southern boundary wall. This was hardly extraordinary. Boundary walls had been identified on the north and west sides of the pyramid as well. What was unusual was that this one was closer to the pyramid than, than, than the others. Because the archaeological record had long since revealed the Egyptians' fastidious attention to precise measurements and symmetries, archaeologist Kamal al-Malak suspected that the wall covered a pit holding a boat connected with the funeral rites of the pharaoh Khufu, or Cheops, as he was known to ancient Greek writers living mi about midway between his time and ours. Archaeologists had found such pits around various pyramid complexes, including that of Khufu, although all were empty at the time of their modern discovery. Further excavation revealed a row of 41 limestone blocks with mortared seams. El Malak chiseled a test hole in one of the stones and peered into the impenetrable darkness of a rectangular pit hewn from the bedrock. As he could not see, he closed his eyes. And then, with my eyes closed, I smelt incense, a very holy, holy, holy smell. I smelt time. I smelt centuries. I smelt history. And then I was sure that the boat was there. Such was the discovery of the royal ship of Khufu. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for those readings. As you're reading about the canoe, I suddenly realized that I actually have um, a reproduction of a painting of two American you know, trappers in a canoe. So I've got to move them more, se more centrally. Um, OK, let's, let's take some questions now. And if you could all try to type your questions. Um, and uh, my wife, Maura, has already type some so the rest of you could start typing your questions. And Moira's questions are, what are, your, what are your daughter's names and why those particular ships? And given that most ships are female, what ships would you have named sons after? And are the ships of any particular country or period your favorites? Well, um, my oldest daughter was born when I still worked for uh, the National Maritime Historical Society. And the NMHS had been founded uh, with the specific intention of rescuing or salvaging a ship called the Kaiolani, <clears throat> which was the last American square rigger to round Cape Horn in commercial sail uh, in 1941. And um, we were having our first child and um, we didn't know the, the sex um, and we didn't have any boys names, but we had a big debate about whether to name her Victoria uh, which was my wife's choice, which is a perfectly respectable name, and it was actually a family name on both sides. Um, but I really wanted to name her Kaiolani. And uh, about a week before she was born, um, well, this, the NMHS was sort of a, at that point, not quite a fly-by-night organization, but things were a little loose. And it wound up that I had the ship's wheel and a portrait of the Kaiolani's namesake on our wall. Uh, for about a year. 
And about a week before our daughter was born, we had some friends over and we were telling them the story about the names and the big argument. And we pointed to the picture of, of Princess Kailani who is the heiress presumptive to the Hawaiian throne and died of a broken heart um, after the annexation. And she was quite beautiful. She was half Scottish and half Hawaiian. And our friend went over and looked at the painting or the photograph and said, you know, her name is Princess Victoria something, 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 something Kailani. And we went, oh, well, that settles it. Um, so she was born and uh, named Victoria Kailani Payne, and she's been Kai since birth. Um, mm -hmm. And as it turns out, the Kailani was born, and I, I mean, I knew this at the time, but we didn't know we were ever gonna move to Maine. And the Kailani was built uh, in Bath and was built by the Sewell uh, family. So it's a, um, it was quite an apt name for her to grow up with in Maine. Our second child, um, also we didn't know the name of whether we didn't know whether she was going to be a boy or a girl either. And um, her name is Madeline Duguay Payne. And Duguay is a family name on my, my wife's side. But the Duguay Troin was a great uh, French um, corsair in the 17th century. And there was a great ship during the French uh, Napoleonic Wars called the Duguay Troin, which was um, captured by the English and named the HMS Implacable which, as it turns out, would have been a far better name for our daughter. <laughs> that was my joke at the beginning. <laughs> um, and if it had been a boy, I, I, you know, we're just really lucky that didn't happen to have to be a problem. Um, I don't know, HMS King George V, I think, would have been a bit laborious. Yeah. Although my, my father-in-law's name is George, so he probably would have approved. Yeah, I, I don't think most of the audience knows about this series of English uh, Navy ship names like Invincible, Inflexible, Implacable, Indomitable also. Well, they have, a, they have a great runs of names. I mean, they have the, the sort of the Greek um, deities, um, they have rivers, they have uh, battles, they have all sorts of, you know, dukes and admirals and all sorts of different categories. Yeah, thank you. And, and then um, Moira had also asked, are the ships of any particular country or period your favorites? No. They're all my favorites, They're all favorites. except for the Zoom waltz. But. <laughs> yes, aesthetically underperforming. Yeah. So Susan's question then is, in fact, Lincoln, do you have a ship of some kind of your own? Um, no, I don't. Um, I had a boat for about four years and discovered that I was much, much better at writing about them than I was at keeping them or convincing my family to go sailing with me. Okay. So unfortunately, I don't. I, I do have, well, that's not true. I have a canoe in our driveway um, that was given to us by a friend before he decamped to Hawaii after he retired. Um, but it's gotten very, very little use and I'm, we're, we're trying to find who its next home will be with. Yeah, so again, one of these, this is your mother question. So how many times a year do you go on the water in a vessel? Uh, not nearly enough. Yeah. Um, Last year, I think I went once to Vinyl Haven. Hmm. Um, but even in normal years, we don't get out on the water that often. Yeah. Can, we, can we get some other questions from um, up? Okay, while we're waiting for more questions, a question I didn't have time to ask earlier on, which was that the sea and civilization has such a huge scope. How did you decide what to write about or what to exclude? Perhaps. Um, well, it, it, it took a long time to write the book. There was an awful lot. It, the, the learning curve on the sea and civilization was horrendous. <laughs> um, I was not a world historian. And in fact, I was barely a maritime historian when I started writing the book. Um, and so I had a lot of catching up to do. And in the course of doing a lot of hurry up research, everything looks exciting and interesting and worth incorporating. So the first draft of the manuscript, first two drafts of the manuscript were pretty much a mess. Um, and it took me a long time to figure out how to approach it. And in the end, what happened was that I decided that each chapter uh, not only had a sort of specific place and a specific time that it covered, but I, once I had sort of done all the, the research, 
and a lot of writing about it, I stood back to see what was the prevailing um, conceit of the chapter and what, what was really the important messages that I wanted to get through um, about that particular period and that particular place or region. So it was a lot of, um, there was, sorry. Oh, wait. Well, um, there was uh, there was a lot of experimenting, and um, but generally the idea of, of just trying to come up with a focus for each chapter, um, as in writing any book, really, um, it just gets more complicated the bigger the the geographic scope and the and the temporal scope. Yeah, that's right. Great job. So we've got a couple more questions um, from John. Maine has a strong history of boat building, continued these days with various wooden boat apprentice shops. Are there other places that have such a focus on maintaining maritime history in such a way? Yes, there are many. Um, in England particularly and um, in France. Um, France, I, I think, has always been a, a place that has gotten short shrift in the Anglo-American tradition because um, the English kept beating them. But then again, the English kept beating everybody. Um, so, uh, but they had a particularly nasty spot for the, for the French. Um, but if you look at world yacht racing today, and if you look at you know, who wins those insane uh, solo round the world circumnavigations, the French are always right up at the top, if not at the top. Um, and they are, and, and most of those races actually start in France. So France, particularly in Brittany, but elsewhere as well, uh, has an exceptionally good um, tradition of um, traditional skills. Um, Scandinavia is filled with places that uh, do traditional boat building. The Pacific Northwest, uh, in I think in Seattle, there's the Center for Wooden Boats. Um, which is, I think, on Lake Union. I was there, but it was 1986, so it's, it's been a while. Um, the person who runs the um, Discovery Boat Building Program at the Maine Maritime Museum actually worked with a friend of mine down in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, at a program that was designed particularly to work with at-risk youth. Um, and they were, I think they're still in business, but it was the Alexandria Seaport Foundation. And... Um, they had a marvelous wooden boat building program. So they're happening all over the place. Uh, there's another guy, I, I can't remember his name at the moment, but uh, he's from Maine, uh, who is a specialist indigenous, in indigenous watercraft. And he's actually getting his master's or PhD at the University of Southampton in England. Um, and he goes all over the world, um, at least virtually. Uh, to examine various cultures and, and how they're either maintaining or reviving traditional boat building skills. Yeah. Uh, on France, I recently picked up a factoid or a theory that it was Napoleon's fault that the French ships did so much worse against the English during the Napoleonic Wars. The English ships were, of course, built of oak, as in the song, Hearts of Oak Are Our Ships, which is a very heavy, dense wood. And Napoleon being from Corsica, they had a different kind of tree which is less dense. And he wanted the French Navy to use the trees from his native island. And that, that you know, they were just inferior and they would um, break up and blow up more often, more easily. So that's, that's an interesting side one. I've, I've never heard that. Mm. Um, I've heard other reasons, but not that one. Yeah. And in fact, the French, um, the French ships, there were two different strat, they had two different tactical operations. Um, broadly speaking, the, the, the French um, tended to shoot, aim high, and the British tended to aim in below the waterline. Um, the French thought if you dismasted the ship and, and you could bring it to bear, um, the, the British thought if you could destroy its seaworthiness and maneuverability, um, you could achieve the same thing. Um, but very often the British would bring French ships into the Navy and, and copy their design or design elements. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what John is saying here. John says the English love capturing French ships 
in the Napoleonic Wars because they were so beautifully built. The Brits' crews were the difference in battle, not the ships. So perhaps my fact that I picked up isn't true after all. It's, it's a nice idea, though. It is. It is. I, I have to research that a bit more. So, uh, and of course, the British ships were run by press gang labor, almost slave labor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then a, a question from Naomi. Wait a minute. Um, what's the relationship and from Naomi King, what's the relationship between culture and designing and crewing ships? Has any particular maritime event surprised you or haunted you? Um, I'm not sure that I, I know that there's a difference or a connection um, between culture and ship design. Um, people tend to design things to, that work in the milieu or the environment that and, and the work that they're intended for. Um, so I'm not entirely sure that um, you can say that there's a, a clear equivalence. Um, another thing that's very important is the environmental uh, issue. Um, and I touch on that, you know, when I talk about the, the prevalence of larger dimensional timber below the Arctic, below the tree line. Um, but also in the Indian Ocean, uh, you tended to get lots of vessels that were built with smaller pieces of wood that were sewn together, um, rather than what you would find in Northern Europe was, was boats built with much longer pieces of timber because in the Middle East, um, <clears throat> a more arid climate, uh, the trees didn't grow that long. And in fact, there's a great description in Herodotus of Egyptian ships being built like brickwork because the planks were were so short and stubby that they all had to be sort of put together like a brick wall, um, as opposed to sort of the, say a Viking ship or you know, a main built schooner where you get great long runs of timber. So environmental factors are, are certainly a, a, a key consideration. But in terms of culture, I don't think that, I've never seen anybody uh, that I can remember uh, draw an equivalence there. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Um, and then uh, another question from Moira, which is, what do you think of these extremely high tech boats we see in the America's Cup? And where do ships end? Are hydrofoil ships, hovercraft, submarines? Well, all of those are, are ships, certainly. Um, what do I think of them? I, um, they're very interesting. Um, I, I'm I think they're appropriate to the time we live in uh, because they, um, they're very high tech, they're made of new fancy materials and every era produces ships that represent to some degree the time and place. Um, the question of whether I think they're attractive or fun or um, sporting, um, that's a, that's a different set of issues. And um, the answer is kind of, I guess, briefly, no. Um, <laughs> they're, they're not as fun. <clears throat> they're, you know, if nobody can afford to, to build even a, a facsimile of what you're, you're racing, um, then I think you're, you know, you're doing something, you know, these, these are ships that are essentially built by corporations, um, not by individuals. So I think it's a, um, you know, teams of technologists. It's, it's a different way of thinking about how to deal with the sea than we're accustomed to. But it's these vessels that are not just the America's Cup, but the, these Vendee round the world um, solo circumnavigators, you know, are doing phenomenal things. And I, I, I don't even know what the world record is for sailing around the world um, solo nonstop. Um, but I remember that, you know, year after, in successive years, people were dropping days um, off of the record times for years on end. And, you know, when will that stop? I don't know. Um, but we must be getting close to a finite, <laughs> I mean, you can't go around the world in a day. So um, where it will stop is anybody's guess. But I think um, so highly with uh, Robin Knox Johnson, I think was about 300 and something days. And now it's, um, I believe it's well under 100. 
Yeah, but a great comment of yours that um, nobody can, an ordinary person cannot get a facsimile of the America's Cup boats. They're just, they're just not for ordinary people. And uh, even beyond Formula One racing cars. And, um, okay, let's, any thoughts um, from John, any thoughts on the future of the Arctic Ray Maritime use? Well, um, yes, it's here. Um, it's, it's already opened up very wide. Uh, I work with a guy at the uh, University of Maine School of Law uh, who is running an Arctic, um, an Arctic Futures Institute. Um, Paul Mayeski at the University of Maine Orno Climate Studies or Climate Change Institute. Uh, Peter Neal at the um, W2O up in, he's based in Cedric. And Charles Norkey is the um, law professor. Uh, down here in Maine, uh, in Portland, and um, they're they're running programs up into Greenland for law students and others. Uh, there's a the Arctic is open, and it's a question of um, you know how much law will get there at the same time as uh, entrepreneurs and people interested in exploiting the Arctic for their own uses. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, question from Anne. What role did Afro-American slaves or free men play in boat building in Maine in the 19th and 18th centuries? Um, that's an that's a interesting question that I have not asked and I don't know the answer to yet. Um, but I, am a, um, I have been working for the last few months with a group that's actually based in Bo Portland uh, called the Atlantic Black Box. <clears throat> and you can look it up, it's on the internet, just look up Atlantic Black Box. And what they are, um, they're, they're doing sort of crowdsourced uh, research across New England, looking at the degree to which New England maritime uh, industries were implicated in the slave trade. Um, not only because they were um, running slaves up to the time where it was, um, outlawed in this country, but uh, through main built ships, for instance, uh, used as slave runners between Africa and the Caribbean and South America in the 1850s. And I was just looking at the database they have for the, um, for the 1850s, and it's extraordinary the number of ships and ships, captains and crews that were um, active in the slave trade when it was illegal to import slaves into this country. But it's not just slavery itself, but of course, the um, transporting the goods of slavery, either cotton to England or cotton to New England mills. Um, you know, the whole economy of, of New England was, and of the entire country, was very, very dependent on slavery. Um, so the question of uh, African-Americans either slaved or free, enslaved or free um, in shipyards is, is not something I've researched yet. Um, we did come across something very interesting at the Maine Maritime Museum this summer. Uh, we were redoing our exhibit on the Wyoming, which was one of the great coal schooners built um, at the, um, well, it was built in 1909. But what was interesting was that uh, it's a photograph taken by a Danish crew member of the crew of the Wyoming, and most of them were uh, African American or black. Maybe some of them were Caribbean, but most of them were black. And this is something they've essentially been written out of the history of the, you know, the, the main schooner story. Uh, although there are occasional references to blacks on board, it's um, it's not widely known, not widely appreciated, and certainly not widely studied. So it's an, it's an area that's ripe for, for further research. Yes, very good point, thank you. Um, from uh, Peter O'Brien, were the J-boats any different? They were corporate builds in a period sense. I think you better explain J-boats to everybody. Well, the J-boats were um, probably the prettiest class of America's cup yachts um, in the 1930s and um, they were sort of corporate built, but I mean, I think Vanderbilt ponied up the money for 
whichever one it was that was built in Bath in, in uh, the 30s. Um, I should know these things, but I, I don't. And one of the reasons I write books is because I have a terrible memory and I can't keep anything in my head for very long. But in any event, um, the, uh, the J boats were, were built, they were generally associated not even with syndicates, but with individuals. Um, so Vanderbilt was one, another was Sir Thomas Lipton who produced five shamrocks uh, to challenge the America's Cup in five different races and <clears throat> never won, but he was a very, very gracious loser. Um, and this of course was Lipton of Lipton T. Um, so, but again, th those boats were, were, they came out of a recognizable, they were an extension of a recognizable tradition in yacht design. Um, that you can trace and, and visually understand from the late 19th century up until really the post-war period. And then in the 1960s, you start getting the 12 meters where, you know, even the equations trying to figure out what a 12 meter actually, you know, why they're even called 12 meters is a very convoluted series of equations. And then they predominated right up until the split keel um, that the Australians developed, I guess, in the 80s or so. Um, so I think that they were very much a part of um, a, a recognizable tradition, as I said, and, and quite distinct from what we see now in the, in the boats being built by, you know, um, I, I can't even remember who the, the builders are these days, but these sort of consortia of yeah. mega wealth, uber wealthy people from around the world. And why were they called J-boats? I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. We have time for one last, we, we have a last question. That's perfect with the timing. So Eric Eames, I've read that you have lectured all over the world. Do any of these lectures or trips or audiences stand out for you, to you? Um, yeah, they, uh, many of, yes, most of them stand out for one reason or another. Um, <clears throat> I guess the funniest experience I had was um, I was invited to um, to a conference in Shanghai and I'd been invited before that um, to my guy who had taught in um, in Texas uh, to go to the um, China Ocean University in Qingdao um, of Qingdao beer fame. And, um, but the difference between his offer and, and the, um, the Shanghai offer was that Shanghai was gonna fly me out there. So I of course could accept. And when I, when I accepted, I wrote to uh, my colleague at Qingdao and I said, you know, do you remember me? We, we corresponded a few years ago. If you can get me from Shanghai to, Dalia, uh, to Qingdao, I'd, be, I'd love to um, come speak at your university. So, um, he said, fine. And I sort of had all of my talks and I knew what I was going to talk about. And then I realized um, perilously close to, I think while I was in Shanghai, in fact, that um, I, I imagined that China Ocean University was sort of like Woods Hole. And it turns out to be nothing like Woods Hole. <laughs> And I had to scramble very quickly to revamp my talk so that it would make some sort of sense to their audience. Um, but, you know, these are the, sort, the sorts of things to get lost in translation. Um, but I've, I've been, uh, on the strength of the sea and civilization, I've been to China twice, to India twice, Sweden, Portugal twice. Um, so it's been a, it, it's been a, unbelievable run um, and certainly nothing I expected when I wrote the book. No, that's fantastic and, and well deserved. So uh, I'll just wrap up. Um, thank you so much. Um, and first of all, you two a huge audience, actually 50, which I think is a, wow. a lot. Well, thank you very much for, for taking the time to, to join us. And you've made it really interesting uh, for all of us. Um, so I think a big round of applause. For the, um, Thank you, Lincoln. And well, thank um, you very much, George. Yeah. And before you go, uh, we all go. I just have to tell you about next month's Meet the Author online series welcomes young adult children's authors, uh, Portland's Terry Farish and Lovell's very own Elizabeth Atkinson in conversation together on Thursday, March 25th, 7, 7 p.m. as usual. And the link will appear on the library 
website a few days before the event. In fact, Beth, do you want to say hello while one of them? Do you want to say something? Sure. Hi. Hi, George. That was wonderful, Lincoln. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just in conversation with Terry Farish. It'll be a slightly different format. Um, we'll just talk a lot about how reading and writing is more important than ever for kids and teens and our experiences in the classrooms. And we hope people bring questions to us about what kids are reading these days and what you think is important. So hope you'll join us next month. I think it's March, did we say 25th? 25th, yeah. So again. Could I just say one more thing? I, I don't know if he's still in the audience, but um, two years ago, I, I was invited by a guy named Jason Zadema, who was here at the beginning of the talk, um, who's with the North American Maritime Ministries Association. And I got invited to speak at his conference down in Charleston. He's actually based in Canada. And that was a really fascinating talk because um, a lot of the talks that I give are to people who are, um, you know, members of historical societies or, or um, organizations that libraries and things like that. But these were people who were actually down sort of in the trenches, as it were, with uh, mariners from around the world. And they do, you know, they literally do God's work. And they are an amazing outfit. And that was a, that was really a very um, memorable um, event. So if Jason is here still, I want to thank him for, for that opportunity. And I also, um, the keynote, the real keynote speaker, uh, and the big draw for that was actually, um, oh God, now his name escapes me, but um, the, the Pan Am hustler, uh, who, um, catch me if you can, uh, who is Ab Abagnale. Um, so that was, but that was, you know, a, an, an, another great example of um, the sorts of sort of serendipitous moments that you get if you if you write a world history. Um, I don't recommend it. It, it. it would probably be more cost effective to just buy the tickets and fly to the places you want to go to anyway. <laughs> All right. That's a great note to end on. Thank you very much, Lincoln, again. Good Thank night. Thank you. Everyone. Cheers. Thanks for doing this.